anyways, um, my name's Eileen, and I've been uh, probably an attendee of what was once called PodCamp for four or five years, and finally this year I said, oh, you know, I take so much from this. It really changed my, my career. Um, I'm an English major, I've been a high school teacher, I've been a ranger at Desert Botanical Garden. I've done a range of things, but right now I write words for the web, basically. So I'm a ghost blogger for businesses, um, CEOs, and just getting into ghost writing uh, ebooks. Uh, mostly it's really just hurting and editing, editing folks. But everything I learned, I learned from PodCamp and my home base, which is Gangplank in downtown Chandler. Uh, we call it a co-working community. Now it is free, come in, uh, use the Wi-Fi, but it's not free as in we like people to give back with social capital. So I'll tell you about some of the things I organize over there and that's some of the things that I volunteer with. I just want to point out, um, these are all of the photos in my uh, slide deck I took because I will talk a little bit about when you're sharing photos and things like that as a volunteer. Um, uh, these fine people uh, take care of a demonstration garden um, at U of A Extension. It's the herb garden. Um, but, you know, if I showed you pictures of people just pulling weeds and things like that, would you ever want to go and do that? But um, what we do is we eat, and we eat really well. These are, people are great cooks. So, you know, here, this is like, you know, come sit down at our table kind of uh, illustration. Uh, this is Craft Tech. It's, it happens at uh, Gangplank uh, once a month, and it's for people who are sharing their skills, people who are craft entrepreneurs, who have Etsy shops and things like that, and people who just come and finish a project where they're not going to be bugged or tempted by the television. And you might recognize these folks over here. Anybody else was with me at ASU Homecoming? The Nerdwalk? Yes, Nerdwalk. Um, so there's all of all of those folks there. And these are all different kinds of volunteering. Now you might have noticed, here was my description. Thank you for responding to that description. Um, <laughs> but you bring nonprofits into the 21st century. You might have lightened on that little phrase there. I have to tell you that um, I often become, when I volunteer for an organization, I care about the organization, I want to meet people, I want to learn new things, and I become the webmistress because I have those skills. Or it's, um, I need your logo so I can put it on your website, and it's like, uh, it's on a piece of paper, and it's this big. Uh, so then I become the graphic designer, and I'm not really learning new things, and I'm kind of isolated, I don't get to interact as much with people. And so I was feeling a little bit burned out with um, some of the organizations I've been part of, because I've been asked to be part of an advisory board for their communication style and their technology, but then I, I get kind of like, there's a little wall, and then there's everybody else. And um, so I thought, so how can I overcome that feeling? And so I wanted to share with you some techniques that I have used for the places that I have volunteered and that I've learned from other volunteers so that you can take what you care about, what you're passionate about. Hey, we could be complete opposites on the political spectrum. That's fine. And, and use it for those. And some of these techniques, or really most of them, you don't have to be a board member. You don't have to be able to log into their accounts. Um, you don't really have to be a staff member to help your nonprofit or your cause um, by amplifying your voice and what you've done and how you've volunteered. So I guess really wanted, what I wanted to say here is that we volunteer because of our passions, because of the stories, because of the people that we meet. And very often these things are not shared. The, this is the time of year that all nonprofits dread because they ask for what? Money. It's, you know, it's time to ask for money so that people can deduct it from their taxes. And yet when you're asked for that, did anybody ever tell you a story of what they did with the money? Um, you know, what the, what the people helped, what volunteers helped to offset, the, you know, your money, you know, things that they volunteered to do that they didn't have to use your money to pay for. And I think that you can do that. You don't have to wait for permission from your organization to do that. But you might also lead the way for those organizations. And I thought this talk was a little bit of an outlier because of it was just a little bit weird. Um, but actually, everything that's been talked about today that applies to business, well, it applies to this. <laughs> if they're trying to build passion for a business, you already have passion for the things that you care about. So I thought, let's talk about us. Um, I'm just putting up here, these are some of the things that I volunteer with. And if you'd like to find out more information, here they are. Um, as a master gardener, I'm 
required to put in so much time in continuing education and then so much time in the community educating people basically about the scientific uh, research done by the University of Arizona that applies to your gardens and landscapes. So that's, that's sort of really where, where that comes from. Um, I also did see our cute little burrowing owl there. So I wrote a, um, I wrote a grant for the Arizona Game and Fish Department to uh, put in an artificial burrow habitat for burrowing owls in a little park in, in Gilbert called San Hero Park. And it's this little forgotten scrap of land that's right next to, to the freeway. Um, these guys are urban birds and they're great neighbors. They eat all of the vermin that you don't want in your house. But we had to get 80 people to come a whole day and do some real physical labor and you can kind of see a little bit what they're doing because there's this rib tubing that goes down about six feet into the ground. I said, they have like 60 degree burrows all, all during the year. It's very nice to live down there. Um, and then bury them back again. So, t but to be telling that story, other people keep asking me, hey, when are you gonna do it again? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, you saw all of us covered in dirt, but um, it was inspiring because so many people who were there shared what they did with other people. Um, so uh, before I get, get into this, um, we often don't connect volunteerism with labor. It's just you're giving your access. Well, no, if, if you actually picture your face on a dollar and you're giving that dollar to an organization, that is, that's the same as your labor, right? It's, it's just a representation of your labor. So I did want to ask um, you about what are some of the areas that you volunteer in? I bet we, there's an intersection too. Can we start with you, Crystal? Sure. Um, I, I do some personal volunteering like through word of mouth where I mentor women in like healthy eating and spirituality and that type of thing, which is really rewarding. And then um, I volunteered with this, um, I wrote it up there, mm -hmm. Phoenix Philanthropists. It's a, it's a meetup group that's mm -hmm. actually gelled a whole lot. I, I just signed up to help on Thanksgiving. I'm going to be helping to decorate St. Vincent de Paul um, for the holidays. So I'm looking for, forward to that. Oh, great. So it's informal and formal. Yeah. Same yeah. Uh, anybody else want to join in? You know, I. I picked on Crystal because I know her, but, but I don't want to make you talk if you don't want to. No, sure. I volunteer with uh, Millennial Choirs and Orchestras. I manage a 700-member youth choir, and I um, don't really know what I'm doing, but someone said, it's just a bunch of emails. You can take my job when I'm done. <laughs> you know, eight hours words. later, here we are. Um, and also, at my kids' high school, it's Mesa High School, we started a, a friend and I started a community advocates group because we saw the need for a bridge between the teachers and the administration and the parents and the community to make it a community hub. And that bridge was just had eroded over time. Well, well me, um, anybody else want to, want to add? I uh, actually, my it's all in the family. We uh, we run an event every year called uh, AZ Give Camp, and it's where we take get developers, uh, internet developers, um, with nonprofit organizations. We spend the weekend and we feed them and we give them a place to crash if they really want to sleep on the floor. And um, they do what they call ninja coding all weekend and build whatever needs the nonprofits have over the course of that weekend. Very cool. So um, often people come volunteering and they think, well, I'll just do whatever they ask me to do, even if it's stupid or wasteful. <laughs> or um, it's, um, it's like this, this is a freebie. But it's not really a freebie. Um, it costs you in time and effort, but it is also of value to the organization that you work to. So that's why I kind of want to emphasize that definition. Um, the um, EU is going through this um, self-examination about how much volunteerism offsets money that they have to spend on their communities. So they're doing quite a few studies um, regionally. This one happened to be in, in um, Scotland. And so they wanted to define informal and, and formal volunteering. So Crystal very eloquently kind of showed us the difference between them. Um, with formal volunteering, some of the techniques I'm going to show you, they have already registered their streams. 
your informal volunteering might be, I'm going to share that I really care about volunteering with, and you know Danny who um, put together the conference, um, she volunteers with CASA, um, which is being an advocate for youth who um, uh, sort of need an advocate in the uh, family court system. So because there is a lot of uh, uh, discretion there, you wouldn't want to talk specifically about, oh, I just came out of court, I'm just crying. But she shares that it's very rewarding for her. And I had never heard of this program before she told me about it. So that's sort of like a, an affiliation. So your informal volunteering is saying, hey, I volunteer with this organization, I really care about it. And you haven't asked for money, you haven't bugged your family about anything, but you're letting people know that you do that. It's so funny, I've organized people to put together a community garden, and nobody told anybody that they were going to be there, or that they were there, or that they're going to be there again anytime soon. And a lot of their you know, friends and neighbors say, how do you helped out? It sounds like a barn raising, I think it'd be fun. You know? So this, um, Thomas McKee uh, just is, has written a new book, and this is his um, conclusion about why people volunteer. Often see this first one, it can be offensive, and we think, well, we volunteer because we're completely altruistic, and then, you know, there's this selfish gene. Um, is there real altruism or anything like that? But look, hey, it's completely okay to say that you volunteer because you're going to get something from it. Um, I'm going to clean up the park because then it's not going to be an eyesore that I'm looking at all the time. Um, we just talked about that relational drive. Well, now we know about CASA. Maybe there's something more that I could do for it because I really respect Danny. I don't know any of the staff who work in CASA, or, um, but I might look into it just because of that. And then the highest level is a, you know, a passion for the cause, and that's what keeps you coming back you know, over and over again. You know how we go through cycles of what's the latest you know, trend right now. If we care about public health, we still care about public health regardless of being bold. The, the kind of the whole thing there. Um, so I just want you to understand, like, it doesn't matter where you are on that spectrum. It doesn't matter where your friends or family or the people who see your streams or your blog or the people that you talk to at work necessarily are. Because all of, all of these levels can engage with what you're doing for your, your nonprofit or volunteer. Okay, little, little tiny writing, but basically this is the Pew Charitable Trust um, surveyed millennials, and it's so funny, it's it's like a, a, a roller coaster of what they really care about. They have no trust in institutions, but they really, really trust that the future is going to be better and brighter. Um, but something that I wanted you to notice is that, so this was September 2013, um, this particular measurement, and you can see millennials on average, 250 friends through Facebook, Gen X about 200, down to boomers 98 and 50. Every time that I approach, you know, a volunteer position, uh, people often say, so where are all the young people? Um, or they complain, like, oh, where are the teenagers? Oh, teenagers these days, oh, they're terrible. Um, no, I just think that they just really haven't been reached. If your organization has concentrated their, uh, their focus on people with lots of money, and they're older, and they're not on Facebook, well, you can help balance this back out again. Where are the fu where's the future of your cause? Where's the future of, of what you care about? If it's endangered species in this particular habitat, or it's um, pets and animal abuse over here, you need the next generation to be engaged. And this is one of, you know, th this is um, how to engage them. Yes, we hear that millennials aren't on Facebook anymore. But well, we're talking really about social streams. So, it, you know, with the knowledge that you gain here, with your experience that you use these communication tools, um, you can help your cause that way. All right, um, do you take questions, Dorian? Oh, sure, you want to? Yeah. <laughs> not a problem. I am very casual. Okay. <laughs> um, can you go back this slide? Sure. Thank you. So, you know, I'm just. I kind of have this concept in my head for an advocacy group that doesn't really exist yet. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just kind of thinking about what you said. And, you know, if you want to change the way society believes about something, I I think maybe it needs to be everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I can see with the environmental piece, right? You have to get the younger people involved. Right. Otherwise, we're all screwed. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm just, I mean, are you kind of saying 
that be aware that you're not going to hit teenagers and people in their young 20s the same way because they're receiving information in a different way. Yeah, you know? right. So, for instance, I mean, everybody, um, there's a broad range of people who care about the Arizona Humane Society, right? But um, these kids, they're not necessarily going to buy a brick for the, the courtyard of the, the new building. Um, but you want to stay engaged with them because they eventually will become that kind of patron. Okay. Or they'll become a brand new, they'll redefine themselves as a patron. All right. Um, and, and what that is. So I don't necessarily say, you know, like, um, and organizations for young people need older people who have experience and money uh, to, to help them as well. Mm. So I'm just kind of mixing it up. Um, this is the, the Pew Internet um, Project, and the reason that I wanted to bring it up is because we're talking mobile right now. So, you know, you don't have to have a laptop, it doesn't, you know, you can, it can be a tablet, it doesn't have to be a tower. Um, uh, Smartphones and feature phones are, are everywhere, they're inexpensive, you don't have to have a contract. And so that's why I kind of wanted to concentrate on them. Also, they're in your hand right there. So you're at that park, or you're at that library, or you're in that board meeting, and it's right, it's right there. You can respond almost immediately. Um, you can tell somebody your story immediately. So again, you can't see this thing, but this, this is where they do a little bit of a breakdown of who accesses the internet and who uses smartphones, right? So we knew that it was uh, young people. And in fact, you know, I wonder if, if um, anyone under 20 really even knows what a, a tower computer <laughs> looks like um, these days, or if certainly, you know, our laptops and our phones have all are probably emerging. Um, but this is what's really interesting. Ever sit down with a cause, a nonprofit, talking amongst yourselves about, I don't know, more people kind of care about this, and then you notice, um, gosh, we all kind of look alike, and we're all from the same class, and we're all from the same region. Um, so the uh, peer research has really found that um, uh, to access the internet, um, actually African Americans and um, Hispanic mobile phone owners access the internet using mobile devices more than um, whites and um, uh, Asian immigrants. So when we talk about um, lowering the digital divide, I think the marketplace has contributed to that, but if you also want to reach a wider audience, and you, and you have a mandate to do that, uh, mobile is the way to go, according to the chair of the Pew Charitable Trust. Um, uh, college educated, so that just means that um, when you're crafting your mobile message, you might want to think about the background of the um, uh, of the person that you're trying to contact. Um, I've always kind of thought that at college educated, while we are also talking about class and certainly um, uh, racial and cultural barriers, um, when people go through a college experience, it seems to almost be an acculturation where we've all been through a similar culture. Um, so sometimes it can be a great unifier. Um, and then when you think about, I want to set up a new organization, I want to contact my organization, uh, and they say, well, you know, we just send letters through the mail. We, we don't contact people. We don't have, we're not even thinking of developing a mobile app or even a, a mobile communication strategy. You have to say, um, there's your funders, mm -hmm. right? There they are. All right, so let's start off with Twitter. Um, you know, Twitter is often thought of as you know the the trivial um, stream because it's so fast and because the water's always moving. And yet, um, this is where they organize Volunteer Week, make a difference day, um, a lot of national um, days around volunteer work, around volunteer culture. So it is really the uh, I would have to say that it's probably the premier stream of volunteers. Um, I just wanted to talk, we talked, we've talked about hashtags for businesses. Well, you need a hashtag, you need to define it, and then you need to share it with people. But I wanted to talk about when you use a hashtag for events, and, you know, we're all over Twitter, right? But it's really about the week after this event, and then you're going to show uh, what happened here to your funders and to new sponsors, right? And the way to actually show them a lot of the interaction, and I have to tell you, as somebody who's volunteered to write grants, I'm not a professional grant writer, um, there are more and more applications that actually require you to say, what is your um, social communication strategy? And what has been your past success with social media communication? So this is 
Um, this is what happened on Thursday, the um, World Usability Day, which was sponsored um, locally by uh, PayPal, and so they, they had a little bit of an event. So with the um, hashtag AZWD, um, here you can see, here's where you invited people to Eventbrite. Um, there's where the hashtag was used on Facebook. Um, here's a free sound. Here was the uh, meetup um, where one of the UX uh, meetups uh, had everybody you know, organized and volunteering through their schedule. And then here's just um, you know one of those um, event bots, is the events that picked it up. So hashtags are really important to causes because it is a way to afterwards understand um, uh, what was your uh, what was your contact with people. Because these are the people who use the hashtag. This isn't your. This is um, bottom up, not top down. Um, this is um, hashtags are also used and shared in campaigns, and I mean, as in literally campaigns. This one, this hashtag was forty dollars, and this was when um, Congress was ready to vote on um, whether or not they were going to uh, continue the um, payroll um, tax cut, and it would have meant about forty dollars on average to every American. Uh, you know, paycheck. So this was the the Obama administration um, invented a hashtag and said what and asked people what does hashtag forty dollars mean to you? Um, because you can measure the metrics of where did this hashtag go, you can find out the effectiveness of your campaign. So this is a literally uh, a political campaign. But imagine another campaign. I was thinking of one um, hashtag would be uh, trees or birdhouses. So to actually share amongst a lot of organizations like the Arbor Day Foundation, um, the Master Gardeners, um, the Arizona Nursery Association about um, respect your trees in Arizona because they support our you know, wildlife. Uh, so, so that's a, sort of another way to share a campaign among organizations. And then you use hashtags to curate engagement. Again, we're like just tracking, well, where were people at that exact event? Um, this hashtag is actually GP Chandler, so that's for everything that happens or whenever people talk about Chandler and the Gangplank uh, location. So the Gangplank Chandler location is actually paid for by um, the city of uh, Chandler's Department of Economic Development. So in order to show them the engagement with the public, which is sometimes a fuzzy number, you know, you could make things up, um, you could try and show, Google Analytics, um, what if you kept a hashtag for your entire organization or your entire space the organization uses? And so for here, um, the um, hashtag brought up, this is um, the YouTube channel for Gangplank, and this was um, uh, this was one of the anchor companies who talked a, a little bit about privacy and security, because we have an open Wi-Fi, so you know, that, that's smart. Um, this was actually my video that I took when I was in the audience and put it on Facebook and it was you know, publicly shared. And this was about um, how the actress Hed Hedy Lamar actually is part of the evolution of Wi-Fi in the United States because she was an inventor. And she invented a way that uh, I think this is regarded um, uh, wirelessly. Torpedoes. Yes. I'm sorry. Fre frequency hopping spread spectrum. I gotta listen to my video. Um, <laughs> but so so you can see how you can see the engagement of this was generated by the organization, this was generated by somebody in the audience. Um, and then it shows you a really broad range. So use invent a hashtag, use the hashtag consistently, ask your organization, ask your cause to use the hashtag, and then they can curate the engagement that they had over the course of a year. Um, this is uh, one of the, uh, I guess, a big brains of a uh, nonprofit. It's a website called Nonprofit Hub, if you'd uh, like to look it up. But this is Mark Koenig. And this is kind of interesting. He's talking about this is why, you, why an organization has to have a blog. Well, I'm going to talk to you. You care about your causes. You should blog about them. Now, you can blog about them as a guest blogger on a specific organization's blog, or you just blog about them. And by blogging, I mean, do you want to write a larger piece on Facebook as well as your own personal blog? Um, but look, he's talking about those um, those three uh, categories of engagement with uh, volunteers. It sounds just like um, Thomas McKee, doesn't it? The true believable, the casual fan, and the reluctant tag along. So we have those folks, you know, here, right? The people who have been here before, the people who came with friends, um, the people who 
you know, children you were forced to come as well. Um, so where do you want to talk about your volunteer or your, your causes? In many of the other seminars, we've talked about, uh, okay, you want to use this stream this way, um, you want to use this strategy with this platform that way. Um, I'm much more casual. You're a volunteer. You've got to organize your time the way you want to. You could blog with your organization. And this is really interesting. This is a button-down Tumblr. You know, I kind of think of Tumblr as, the, well, you know, like the tumble dry cycle in your dryer. People just throw everything in there. And it's fun and crazy. It also uh, tends to be a younger audience. Um, but this is an organization in, in Washington, D.C. Um, where you have a more formal blog um, on, on Tumblr, but uh, you could use your own blogger, right? Um, I, I use blogger because I just want to prove that I know how to use blogger. <laughs> um, so Tumblr and blogger both have, um, both have apps. The number one thing when we talk about blogging and trying to engage people is that people don't do it. Because they, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm sort of an academic-ish writer, and I have been a reporter for um, a local newspaper um, back in Michigan where I grew up. And I always think, I have to have all the research, I have to have all the quotes just right, and what I'm asking you to do is do it in the moment. I felt passionately about this. I helped trim the roses at Mesa Community College. I, I am pro-roses. I feel invigorated. It was great. Uh, I was so angry at somebody, I just decimated those roses. Um, do it right then, do it, use, use your phone. Don't wait until you've got your laptop, don't wait until you get home, do it on you using an app right away. All the apps sort of look alike, they sort of, they don't have as many of the uh, features as you would get on your laptop. Um, so here's sort of an example. Um, uh, we helped write uh, an app for Desert Rivers Audubon. They had a book which was, uh, find um, 100 best burning spots in the Phoenix area. And instead of republishing the book, they um, transitioned and published it as an app. And so it's available on the app store. It's about 10 bucks. Um, this was um, a meeting at a, sort of a local, um, a local sporting goods store uh, where it was, there's a open gala, come and download a beta version of the app for free. And so this is it. This is the this is all that the blog that appeared on Tumblr looked like. Just that. Um, check out the new features. Here's a picture. We're done. All right? And first of all, it's done so people can actually see it. It's got the name of the organization and what people are actually doing, and it's an engaging photo. And also it's not a professional photo, okay? It's just it's just in the moment. Okay. So here's the, the second stage. So you're at an event, and it's lasting more than an hour or so. So you've got time to write a paragraph. You say, well, what? I'm going to write a paragraph. Well, you're going to take a picture, and then you're just going to describe what's in the picture. So this, this is a blog. I know that we think of the 500-word blog, and we think of the 1,000-word blog. This is a blog because it gets out the pertinent information. Look, all these people had fun. Um, digging their burning out shelters. Look, we involve girls with tools. Um, that's wonderful. Um, maybe Ace Hardware is going to see it. Um, people who, who um, also want their girls involved in something like that. So please don't take too much time, right? Um, there wasn't a lot of research with that. It's all accurate, and it all helps the organization. Because if you went home and did nothing, then the story stops with you, right? All right, and then this is the shot, you know, like everybody's like, oh, I don't want to stand there for our photo at the end of the day. Well, this is your last blog from the event or uh, from the campaign or from headquarters or from your meeting. Hey, we just had a board meeting where, you know, we, we're working really hard for you. We spent three hours, you know, getting a new policy together. Um, and you might think that this, this is boring, but it's, oh, I can step into that picture. I can be among these people. I, and you don't need anything more than just um, uh, just a, a sentence or two. That's fine for Blogger, WordPress, um, upload it with um, Tumblr. It's on your phone. How many photos have you lost because they're just sitting on the phone and they've never gone anywhere else and nobody else has ever, has ever seen them? Also, I do not want to give you advice about what, where, when you can take photographs. All of these are my photographs, first of all, so that's why I can use them in the, in the uh, 
in the presentation, but um, these were all public places, and the kids and their parents um, with the Audubon there, they signed a photo release. Uh, but I want you to ask um, Ruth, who's giving the last presentation, Ask a Lawyer, all about that. She's written a book called The Legal Side of Blogging, and I highly recommend it. It's less than five bucks, and you can find it on Amazon. Okay, so I wanted to describe this. See this guy here with this tree? So this is the uh, urban forester with um, the city of Phoenix. His name is Richard Atkins. And I went through a process about, um, well, when Richard uh, goes to plant a tree, hundreds of volunteers will show up because they really want to do a thing. You know, they, they might be people who cannot give you a long-term commitment, or they want their kids to see, you know, something living, or they or they want to be able to pass it and say, hey, I helped plant that tree. But there was hundreds of volunteers who knew nothing about planting trees, a bunch of holes in the ground, um, you know, a bunch of crowbars, and poor old Richard all by himself. So <laughs> he wanted to teach other people to teach other people how to plant trees. And so I took photographs of the entire process of how to plant trees, and then I made a little, I captioned all of them, and I uploaded them right away to my Flickr account and was done. And I, and I set them as Creative Commons. A year later, Richard's current intern said, can we have all of his photos? Because we need, we need to use them in a presentation. And it was like, well, of course, of course you can. Uh, so these things have a longer life. Uh, and I think they're, they can be uh, pretty important. So um, send them as, uh, send them to the organizer of your event. Um, find a place where you're going to curate them so that they don't, so they can be shared among people. All right, and uh, oh, this is, let's see. Oh, this is the, this is the WordPress. That's what its interface looks like. Um, so write it right now. So this is an event that occurs monthly over a gangplank. It's called Drink and Draw. Um, and in fact, the next one is, is Monday. So it's third Monday. It's bring your own beverage of choice. And a artist will give you a 20-minute demo, and then we just sit and we draw together. This information <coughs> needs to get out <coughs> so that people can see it and join in on it. And so that they have an idea of what does it look like and how can I join in? Um, so just answer these questions, throw it up there, and get it done. And then it can be shared among people. Because I just keep telling people, but they cannot search on those terms, or they can't see it on the, the event spaces blog, and what good does it do? Um, to all the people who organized it and, and really care about it. Um, this is Tobria Castle. You know, that's the um, funny looking uh, wedding cake kind of building that you can see from the 202. It um, comes from the 1920s. It's very photogenic. And all of the people who have volunteered there, and I volunteered to help restore the, the gardens on, on the grounds two years before it was open to the, to the public, people were very, very curious about it. So this is a shared um, photo group on Flickr so that all of us and all of the people who passed to a very castle can all, um, can all post photos. And it helped satisfy some of the curiosity and ignited um, a real interest in the castle before it was open. And now, every single tour is just is sold out and booked for years, actually, over there. So, um, so this is this is another way to engage, especially if you have something that that is charismatic like that. Um, I like Flickr. I know people who work with Picasa. That's fine too. Uh, it just seems like Flickr's coming through a new resurgence. Remember your hashtags. Remember to tag where it actually is. And you know, you have your Flickr app. It's got three things it wants to know. Where was this taken? What group do you want to put it in? And what uh, is the caption? So just use a hashtag for your caption. That's it. Um, I want to tell you about a sort of a regret that I have uh, when we're talking about actually engaging people with Facebook. This is the Master Gardener's Facebook page. It's sort of static. Here's the latest research from the University of Arizona. Here's our next classes, that kind of thing. This is a Facebook group called Maricopa County Backyard Gardeners, and it, there's stuff in there every day. People are posting every day. There are there are close to a thousand members. There are new photos every day. Um, I would say that if I were going to do this over again, I would not do a page. I would do a group, and so that I would engage 
all gardeners over here and give them really good information. Because what's happening is that we need to assign our master gardener volunteers to take their time and to go through these forums because there's bad information all the time on these forums. What happens is people crowdsource a problem. It's like they post a picture of a bug and then they invite everybody to decide what that bug is. And well, there's only one answer to what that bug is. It could be a bad picture, you know, whether it's friend or foe or something like that. So we actually have our, our volunteers working in these groups. So I would say um, find a group that's affiliated with your cause. Stay in that group. I would not spend much time um, posting to the page of your cause or your organization. I just don't think it really goes anywhere. Um, so um, take a group and curate it. All right, Pinterest. Um, you would think that there'd be much to do with uh, nonprofits on Pinterest because there aren't engaging photos. But this is actually a foundation um, for uh, breast cancer research, and all of the, uh, uh, most of their boards are about tattoos um, that women have, um, uh, you know, after after their treatment is this really a symbol of what they've been through. This is extremely engaging, and this is the only um, presence they have in the web. So all that time you spend on Pinterest. Uh, give a few pins to your favorite calls. Did you just say that's the only that's the only presence they don't on have the a web? Yeah, period. they don't they don't have a website. They only have the Pinterest presence. So when you click on those photos, it goes to their personal blog or their. Um, it would just be the it would be the pins that the organization has sort of put up there, and I think a couple of the boards are community boards where people have pinned their own things. Okay. Okay. So what month is this? <laughs> Yes! You know what it really is? It's Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Yay! This party. Um, I wonder what that logo looks like. So, Movember is all about the humor of mustaches while at the same time talking about men's health issues. This is all user generated. It has a sense of humor. You can contribute to that. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, Hands on Grand Phoenix. They do not have a responsive uh, website, but you can get it up on your phone, um, and it has a chance for you to list what you need done, and as a volunteer, what you would like to do. And then they also um, look for leaders. So if you would like, if you would like to lead in a certain cause or a certain project, so I just want to show you that um, volunteer match app. I work with a lot of these folks. They've come through. Um, what's great about this is that. Um, there are a lot of civic organizations and corporations who send their people to this app, right? So if you're really tired and exhausted, always being the go-to volunteer for something, just sit up here and they'll find you by the region. All right, I just want to show you a few of these um, fundraising apps. I'm going to go through these um, pretty fast, but you can find them. This is just, if you decide, I could do without a cup of coffee in the morning from Starbucks. So you say that, and the amount of money you can choose to donate to um, a cause of your choice. Um, so you can list your cause on there, and you can also invite your friends to do it as well. But this is something you can do independent. Uh, one day's wages is, again, um, figure out what a day's wages in all different parts of the country is, and then you calculate your own day's wages, and you have an opportunity to donate there as well. Um, Health Bridge is a chance to help somebody who's in a disaster, or if you're in a natural, you know, or man-made disaster, I suppose, um, you only have to hit one button, and everybody in a group that you would want to know that you're okay is informed. Um, uh, one today is spend one dollar, give one dollar to a cause. So if all of, this is a Google app, so if, every, if all of the billions of people who use uh, Google products gave one dollar to one cause, imagine what would happen to that cause. You can list your cause with them as well. Um, check in for good is interesting because it's like I still can't figure out where the money's coming from. Um, you go to a big venue, especially a stadium, you check in and um, the venue or a group of some of the players um, have pledged up to a certain amount to give like five cents for each check-in. So if you go to some of these larger venues, they also recruit small businesses to do a check-in for good. And so the small business has an opportunity to talk to you about their stuff and about what they care about um, as, a, as a cause. I'm sorry, am I over time? I'm not even looking at my time. Am I okay? Okay. It's three. Yeah, it's three. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so 
with your security miles. Um, you just uh, you log in, you tell them how many miles you brought, and they're big pledgers, uh, pledge money to your um, charity of choice. Here are some more opportunities where you can help, including AZ Gift Cap. Um, uh, this is uh, if you have some development skills, or if you want to approach them and say, this is how I really think the app should work. So you don't necessarily have to have coding skills to contribute to these organizations. And then, here we go, this is my last slide. Um, if you'd like more information on especially um, mobile technology and helping out nonprofits and civic organizations, even your old organization, um, I went to the Phoenix Mobile Festival, it was just uh, about three or four weeks ago. It happens annually. You can find out more information on the meetup there and we have a monthly meetup. Um, great for beginners, they were very welcome. I have Sam, I'm a beginner. And um, come and visit me at Hank Mike Chandler, a hack night that's every Wednesday night. Um, and uh, we have group projects that, that we work on, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. And I'm sorry I went over. Yeah. I'm so worried I was going to go under. I think the early. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. great. Right. Right. Um, so do you have any questions or maybe any comments about what are the current stuff that you're working on or um, how you could use some of these techniques or even some of these apps to help your causes? Can you back up what I just Oh, mentioned? sure. What's up for check-in for good? Was there oh, check-in for good. Charity, charity Miles. miles yeah. All right. So Charity Miles, the uh, organization behind it, has already raised the money. So up to like a certain amount. You can see like up to a million dollars, and they will pledge, um, you know, money when you uh, complete something, and then you you get to pick from their list of organizations that they're going to donate to. Actually, I have a question about fundraising. What do you think about transparency in fundraising? I know you find out like 80% of your donation. Yeah, like Charity Navigator is working on an app or they've completed an app. So you're going to look for somebody on Charity Navigator who has uh, uh, four stars or five stars because they have taken all of the, their IRS filings, they analyze them, and, and, he, and I think it is. 10% or less should, that's their benchmark, should be spent on the administration. I think Charity Navigator. Charity Navigator. Thank you. Yeah. So how do you connect your current volunteers? Like, is that still by email or to, like, you know, when is the next event if it's not a third Monday or that kind of thing? Well, you, you know that, that app right there, and I'm, I'm happy to unhook here, help these guys. Oh. Um, So, um, Volunteer Match has built-in reminders. Okay, so we can ask our current volunteers to yes, go to, through there. Yes, to go through there. And then there's also Sign of Genius. And uh, I believe that yeah, we love that. Yeah. Um, I believe they're working on a mobile app as well, right. but I have oh, not seen it yet. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't it be because then people don't have to carry paper? It's, yeah, right. You know what? I like it that people can look and go, oh, He's volunteering then. I like working with him. Or, you know, oh, oh you know, uh, <laughs> I'm not volunteering that hour or whatever. So it really works out. Or, oh, goodness, nobody's volunteering for this particular thing. I can do that. Oh, plus I'll ask my mother to come. You know? Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and then I have a friend. Love it. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much.